Let's go ahead and jump right in uh, with verse one. It would be helpful today to, if you have your Bible, to um, follow along. And we're going to go in and out and in and out of the passage all the way through chapter seven. So starting in verse one, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. No one blames him for that. Now, the Jews' feast of the booths was at hand. Okay, the context um, when he says after this, there are months of time that's being skipped by John as he puts this gospel account together. And we kind of know that based on the different feasts that are happening that he describes and the other the other gospels give some other, you know, lots of other stories that happened in between these times. But there's just a couple of things I want to note about the current context here. It says Jesus was going about in Galilee, which is northern Israel, right? And he's spending most of his time there because the the Jews in Judea, in the southern part of the land, specifically Jerusalem, were seeking to kill him. Um, if you remember, secondly, the last thing that happened in Judea, uh, we looked at in chapter 5. So the feeding of the 5,000 was in chapter 6, more in Galilee. But in chapter 5, um, it was the healing of the invalid at the pool of Bethesda, where Jesus healed on the Sabbath, and it caused a big stir. Um, that was probably a year or a year and a half earlier than chapter 7 now, when Jesus is headed, we'll see in a little bit, headed back into Jerusalem. So there's plenty of time for rumors to be forming about uh, what uh, Jesus had done in Jerusalem, and uh, people are about to find out a little bit more about him. So the Feast of Booths was at hand, it says. I want to describe the Feast of Booths a little bit. Um, I didn't know most of this except for my study um, in the recent weeks, but uh, this is a long-standing tradition of the Jews, um, and it's one of three major pilgrimages to Jerusalem. This one, the Feast of Booths, is actually the most celebrated, or, or was, the most celebrated and most highly attended event. Everyone would go to the feast. In uh, Deuteronomy, when you read about it, it says, uh, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns, all are supposed to go to this feast in Jerusalem. And it was a feast for seven days. Um, and if you're like keeping track, you have the, the Passover feast. I think you have the Feast of Weeks. These are the other major times that the Jews go to Jerusalem. The Feast of Weeks, which is at the beginning of the harvest. And then you have this Feast of Booths that we're looking at now. So a seven-day festival. And what was it about? Um, there's probably like a lot of our holidays, maybe there's a lot to it maybe some of us celebrate um, multiple things at once and some kind of some things kind of get combined and stuff so our thanksgiving has a little bit to do with this and that and our our you know and and christmas has a little bit to do with this and that and you know we kind of mix things in but this festival from what i can find has kind of had these three main focuses first of all it was a time of remembrance of of the past of the Jews time in the wilderness to remind them of when they were rescued from Egypt by God and when he provided for them in the wilderness and when God made them dwell in these temporary dwellings or booths in the wilderness. They're reminded of this. So the Feast of Booths, people would come together and for that week, they would live in more or less tents. Okay, so everybody comes to Jerusalem, everybody coming from out of town makes kind of these temporary dwellings of branches and wood all around town. And people in the town who already live there, they would probably set up this booth or tent um, on their roof or in their courtyard, kind of leaving space out on the streets for everybody else. And it's just this nationwide camping festival with lots of eating and drinking and celebrating and remembering how God provided in the wilderness. How specifically did God provide two of the most noticeable things or the most memorable things that he did for their people was he provided manna 
and he provided water from the rock. If you remember that at the beginning of their time in the wilderness and at the end, uh, we won't read the story, but uh, Moses strikes the rock and water pours out because the people are very thirsty. Um, that water from the rock incident is uh, especially memorable and mentioned a number of times throughout the Old Testament um, as a reminder of the provision of God. Water, that most basic uh, provision of life. Water is life. So they uh, remember that and their time in the wilderness in booths when God provided in that way. It was also a time in the present of thanksgiving and of supplication to God. So the feast occurs at the end of the harvest, after everything is brought in. It's also called the Feast of Ingathering in Exodus. Um, so it happens in September or October-ish. And it is a celebration or was a celebration of the goodness and the provision of God in that last season. Look at all that God has provided for us. So it's like a Jewish Thanksgiving of sorts. Um, some of the festivities of the, the festival included the men holding like these branches and these fruits that, that represent the, the pro produce of what God had provided in this recent year. And they would hold those and they'd shake them and wave them around at different times. And in, in thanking God for his recent provision, they were also kind of praying for the future year that God would provide rain again so that their land would be would be fruitful again. So was, that's kind of what's going on in the present. They're asking God, would you, you've provided this last year, would you provide for us again? Thirdly, the feast was a time of future anticipation where they would anticipate the spirit of God coming. Um, the Jews knew that in the future messianic kingdom, God would pour out his goodness on the land and on the people and, and give his eternal provision to them in the spirit. And we see or read images like Ezekiel 47 that speaks of this river of life that's flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem and it's healing the land and providing abundant fruit everywhere it goes. And we see images like in Isaiah, I'll read Isaiah 32, 15, where they look forward to when the spirit is poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. And it goes on to talk about how this would be a time of peace and of, of rest and quietness and abundance for the people. So they're, they're anticipating at the Feast of Booths this future outpouring of God's Spirit in the last days. And it was tied to this Feast of Booths because in Zechariah 14, uh, which was read on the first day of the feast, um, we see that even in the new kingdom, when the spirit of God kind of is watering the land, all the nations will come to Jerusalem to keep the feast of booths. We read in Zechariah 14, 16 through 19. So the, the feast of booths is done kind of as a commemoration to the life-giving provisions of God. And if you notice that that look past to the wilderness, the present, to, to the rain next year, and that future to the outpouring of the spirit, that all has something kind of to do with water. He sustained us with the water from the rock in the wilderness. He hope he has sustained our, our crops this year and hopefully the next, and there will be this future outpouring of the spirit. So the Jews, they come to this feast kind of figuratively thirsty, in essence, asking God to just quench their thirst. And to highlight that, there is um, or was what's called this water drawing ceremony um, that started kind of, I think, a couple hundred years before Jesus, that at the feast, each day of the feast, it's seven days, each day of the feast, the high priest would draw water uh, from the pool of Siloam, kind of the main water source in Jerusalem. And he'd, he'd draw it up in this golden pitcher like thing. And then he would kind of parade it through town all the way uh, to the temple. So he's holding water, carrying it through town in this beautiful 
uh, golden flag on and the, the shofars are blowing and the temple choir is singing from the Psalms and men are raising the produce in their hands. They're giving thanks to God saying, would you provide for us? And this pitcher of water then when the priest gets to the temple, he pours it out at the, at the base of the altar. Okay. So I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures um, to kind of highlight what's going on here. Uh, this here is right now, um, or within, in recent years, this is the pool of Siloam. Um, you see these steps going down, the water would come up to a certain level on them. Um, here's, here's just another angle of that. Here is an artist rendition of, of what that pool maybe would have looked like in the day. Um, this is the main water source in town. It's being fed by hezekiah's tunnel some of you jeff you've i don't know if you walked through that when you were in jerusalem but um and so hezekiah built this tunnel and it it, it funnels water into the pool of siloam where it can i suppose feed the rest of the city um it would be carried by the high priest in some kind of a gold pitcher like this and you can see here can you all see my mouse on the screen Okay, um, this is just a 3D model of Jerusalem miniature. And um, this is where they're saying the pool of Siloam is. I think it would actually be more down here, but anyway, he would uh, draw water out of that pool and then he'd walk all the way through these streets and up these stairs all the way up into the temple and pour that out on the, the base of the altar. Here's another rendition of it. There's the pool at the bottom, walks all the way through town, all the way up into the temple. And um, these are those actual steps. Uh, we'll hopefully, those of us going to Israel next year, uh, we'll, we'll get to walk on these steps as well. Um, they still exist. These are first century, the steps that, that would have been around in Jesus' day and the exact story that we're reading about in John chapter seven that the people were walking on that you can still go to today. This last one kind of shows the steps and then kind of an artist has shown what it would look like to just continue on up the road. So pretty cool. I wonder if they thought when they would get to the temple, like probably not, but maybe just maybe this is the time that maybe that water that was poured on the altar would begin to flow out of the temple like maybe this is the time that that something like that is going to go down and maybe there's this little bit of anticipation for those who knew the significance but every year this festival took place for seven days the same water drawing ritual would happen and the people would be saying lord will you provide you have provided would you continue to provide and this is still celebrated, the Feast of Booths, by some more Orthodox Jews, especially uh, Sukkot. I don't know if it comes up on our uh, calendars in, uh, on holidays, um, but Sukkot is uh, this year will happen September 20th through 27th. I looked it up. And um, people, some will actually uh, build, they'll put together little temporary dwellings. And um, I got a picture of that too. This is um, in, in recent times when some people would do that. So they have these just kind of wood based structures throughout town. Kind of cool. I mean, it just looks like a, a big kind of a, a party, a camping trip or something. And uh, here's just another version. They have specific, you know, ways that they're supposed to build according to Jewish tradition. And um, here's like a, a modern day family. They, they wouldn't, now I don't think m most people, unless you're the most Orthodox of Orthodox Jews, um, you don't really sleep in this structure that you'd set up, but you at least go out in it and you eat some meals and you pray and you read some scripture and stuff like that. Uh, but then you spend the rest of the, you know, the night and everything in your house, um, but still being celebrated. Um, <laughs> This is the best festival I can imagine because I love camping um, and it's just like this massive camping thing. Everybody's feasting. Nobody's working. 
Um, everybody's anticipating the coming kingdom. Uh, Mary Beth and I, and some of you uh, have started kind of celebrating a Passover meal of sorts. And uh, now I'm thinking, man, maybe we should do something like this too. In fact, Mary Beth and I are going camping. We have a trip scheduled in October to go camping ourselves. So maybe we're going to like turn this into something significant. Um, but past, present, and future significance, a thanksgiving and request for the life-giving water of God, Feast of Booths. Now, I probably need to look at the rest of the chapter. Jesus went about in Galilee, verse 1 says, he would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. The Feast of Booths was at hand, verse 3. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. And you do these things, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. So we'll stop there. Everyone goes to the feast, Galileans, Judeans, even some people from outside of the area. And Jesus' brothers are suggesting kind of to Jesus to, to come to the festival with them and kind of like to do some tricks to increase his popularity. The net version in verse four says, don't you want to make a reputation for yourself? Or don't you want to be popular? I think it's kind of a taunt, um, kind of like what Jesus got when he was on the cross later, you know, where they, several people call out to him, hey, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. I think his brothers are kind of like that. It says not even his, his brothers believed in him. So I think they're just kind of poking fun at him. You've had some people kind of stop following you, Jesus, we saw in, in chapter six. So maybe you can do some more magic tricks and kind of bring people back uh, to follow you. And if you really want to get a lot of people together to see what you're doing, then how about the Feast of Booths that everybody comes to? And Jesus kind of responds, showing, hey, he doesn't come to be popular. Um, in fact, he says uh, in verse 7, he says I, that he'll be hated. And you think, whoa, that's kind of a big statement um, so far in the book. Like they're kind of poking fun, like, hey, Jesus, why don't you do this? <laughs> we can get him. And then he's like, hey, the, the world or the cosmos hates me. And if we haven't seen already in John's gospel, um, here it's made clear that Jesus is unique and people form an opinion about him and you can't walk away from Jesus with, with neutral feelings. The world hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Now, the next verse in verse 10 gets a little confusing. It says, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up but not publicly, but in private. Wait a second. I thought Jesus said he wasn't going to the feast, like really clearly in those first verses. But I think he was saying not now and not like that. Not right now. My time hasn't fully come. He doesn't, he doesn't go to the beginning of the feast. We're going to see he goes halfway through. So not right now and not like that. Like, brothers, you want me to go in real publicly, but for now, I go privately. So not now and not like that. In verse 11, so Jesus goes up to the feast in private. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he's leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Everyone is so scared to say something about Jesus publicly. It says they were muttering or they were whispering. Everybody's kind of talking. And we're just seeing here that there are differing opinions of Jesus. And they vary greatly. Um, but they're not just neutral. Some say he's a good man. Some say he's leading the people astray. 
maybe those are two categories that we even hear people in our day kind of put Jesus in. He's a good man, or he's 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 driving people towards something that's that's not good for humanity. But Jesus always provokes a response. You're going to see this throughout this chapter. There's no neutral response to him. Verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. So he's not afraid to show himself openly here. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Or there's, there's something unique about this guy. Where, where is he getting all this? Verse 16, so Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So if you speak what you think on your own authority, there's probably bias in that, right? Because it's coming from you. You probably want people to believe you. You get some kind of a profit from it, some kind of money or glory or something. But if you champion the truth of someone else, it's more likely that you can be trusted, right? Because your motives are right because I'm communicating what, what, what they're saying. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing here. I think verse 19 um, it's probably best seen as a new paragraph, like uh, the new American standard kind of makes it. He's going into some of, some of his teaching here. He says, has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm being treated differently than others. Like there's plenty of laws being broken all the time, like he's about to show here. Why are you seeking to kill me? So something unique about Jesus, he's, he's drawing attention to and saying, I'm being treated differently than everybody else. People are forming specific opinions about me. And verse 20, the crowd answered, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Now, this could be a little bit confusing. Um, remember, everybody has come to the feast. So not everybody has witnessed everything like the Jews that were seeking to kill him in chapter five that seem to be known by different people. Um, they are there, but people have come from all over the place. So not everybody kind of knows that, yeah, they actually were seeking to kill him. He's not, he's not just talking like a demon possessed person. Um, and verse 21, Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So we come to kind of the center section of teaching of Jesus and why teaching on the Sabbath right here and now, kind of in this tense time. Um, if you remember, like I said, uh, the last thing that Jesus did in Jerusalem was to heal a man on the Sabbath. And so that conflict is kind of getting, getting brought up here. And here's just Jesus teaching in a nutshell. Um, so in the Torah, there are kind of two laws at play here in what Jesus is describing. One law is that we are to remember the Sabbath, right, and keep it holy and not do any work on it. Okay, remember the Sabbath. And then secondly, there's the laws that all males are to be circumcised eight days after they're born. Okay, no big deal. We can try to keep both of those. But uh oh, what if the eighth day, the day of circumcision falls on a Sabbath? Do you complete the work of circumcision and break the Sabbath? Or do you keep the Sabbath and break the eighth day circumcision rule? Right? So there's kind of this gray area. What are we supposed to do? It's kind of like um, another part of the law is that if you see somebody's donkey fall down, you should help it up. In Deuteronomy 22, we read that. But but what if somebody's donkey falls on the Sabbath? Are you supposed to help or not? 
And so there's these different kind of scenarios that come up. In Matthew 12, Jesus describes a couple of them. And the conclusion is, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So there's kind of a hierarchy of precedence in the law. And even the Pharisees knew that that had to be the case. In fact, it was commonly agreed that it would be okay to do the work of circumcision, even if it was on the Sabbath. If that was the eighth day and when it needed to happen, it was okay to quote unquote, break the Sabbath in order to keep circumcision because that command was prior to Moses and took precedence over the law of Moses, right? So I think like for us, maybe something similar that we might experience, like some of us have tried recently to plan to take a day of rest to, to Sabbath, and maybe you've got some naps scheduled and maybe you've got some food already pre-made in your fridge and maybe you've got some reading planned and maybe you're going to watch a movie and maybe you're going to take a nice casual walk around the park you got your day planned out and a friend calls and says hey i got in a car accident can i get a ride do you respond oh sorry it's my sabbath you know i, I just can't help you out well no um so the first point here, just that I think of Jesus' argument is maybe there are some instances when it's okay on the surface to, to break, quote unquote, to break the Torah law. Um, the second point then, though, is that uh, circumcision was seen as perfecting that part of the body. And if you're just listening on the podcast, I'm pointing down like below my belt. The, the circumcision was to perfect that part um, or to uh, ceremonially cleanse the part being circumcised. And Jesus is saying, how much more should I perfect someone's whole body as he had done for the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the invalid man? So just a summary maybe of what Jesus is saying here is sometimes there is more going on than what's on the surface. Or how he says it is, uh, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment okay like we're gonna have to we're gonna have to look closely at this and not just make the quick call oh he broke the sabbath but wait a second what about this we got to ask some more questions don't judge by appearances but with right judgment and i wonder at this point if this isn't just jesus setting up i'm not sure about this can't read jesus mind but if this isn't jesus setting up this idea that everyone is making judgments about him and you're gonna have to take a deep look into him and look below the surface because he's not seeking popularity like this appearance uh, to be judged by but he's he's speaking in this deep way like somebody's going to say later that he's that has never been heard before so don't maybe jesus is saying don't judge me too quickly with what's on the surface but judge rightly i wonder in verse 25 some of the people of Jerusalem, therefore, said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? So these are the Jerusalemites who probably did see or hear about this healing, the invalid. And they're like, yeah, they're, they are seeking to kill him. Verse 26, and here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. Implication here is that since they don't know the father, they won't know Jesus whom he has sent. Um, where he actually comes from is kind of secondary to the fact that they just don't even know God. Verse 29, I know him, Jesus says, for I come from him and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And we'll stop there. So, so the, the believers are like, what more does this guy need to do to prove himself? He's healing people. He's talking like a genius. Um, but you can see just in this, uh, this section here, just this struggle and this division and these different opinions that are uh, 
uh, coming to people's minds and you can hear kind of this this inner battle and people, hey, why aren't if this is the guy that they're seeking to kill, then why aren't they arresting him? Um, like, are they wondering if he's actually the Messiah? But, but no, 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 he can't be the Messiah because we won't know where the Messiah comes from. And we know where this guy comes from. Galilee is, is what they're thinking. Um, and, and then you've got these people, on the other hand, who are believing in Jesus. So, so much just different thought about who he is. And there's just this struggle of, of what is going on with this guy. The Pharisees, verse 32, heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Okay, so we've got to put this fire out. Verse 33, Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you'll seek me, and you won't find me, and where I am, you cannot come? So as always, uh, people are kind of thinking about an inch in front of their eyes or, or very naturally when Jesus is talking supernaturally, like, hey, something's about to happen. And what Jesus is really saying, which he describes later, um, that he's going to be going back to the Father in heaven where they can't come, not just to the dispersion to the Greeks, which, by the way, him going back to the Father because the Jews uh, had rejected him, uh, his word is actually going to go to the Greeks. But anyway, it's kind of a lot of irony going on here. But we get to verse 37. I think this is kind of where uh, maybe the climax of the, the chapter is. On the last day of the feast, the great day. Now, stop there for just a second. I want to remind you about the Feast of Booths, okay? So get this. They're remembering God's provision of water in the wilderness from a rock so that the Israelites don't die. They're giving thanks to God for his provision in the recent harvest and they're, they're praying that God would provide rain for the next season. They're anticipating the Messiah's arrival and his kingdom, whether it be this provision of this outpouring of the spirit to water the land. And there's this water ceremony where the high priest is parading this water through the town and there's shofars being blown, getting everybody's attention. And the Levites are singing from Psalm 113 to 118. They're singing things like, oh, Lord, I pray, deliver us. Save us, we pray, O oh Lord. And the priest is taking this water and he pour it out on the altar for seven days straight, asking God, would you provide water for your people? Oh God, you provided in the wilderness. You provided this last year. You will provide at the end of age. We are thirsty for your provision. And then listen to what happens this final day of the feast. Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, but Jesus, because Jesus was not yet glorified. To the thirsty crowds, crying out to God for his provision. Jesus says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. It's very similar to what he said to the woman at the well in chapter four, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. People everywhere had come to Jerusalem seeking the provision of God. And this year they could stop drawing water from the pool of Siloam because God had provided his ultimate provision, this life-giving water of his son. So Jesus is expressing himself as the fulfillment of all that this Feast of Booths represents. Jesus is the provider of life. He is the water that they are asking for. And check this out, um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, when he's speaking about the Israelites in the wilderness, he says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Isn't that cool? They didn't know it in the wilderness, 
but Jesus had been sustaining them as the rock in the wilderness. They didn't know it, but Jesus had created those crops that they were waving around in their hands and would be the one to provide rain for their next crop. They didn't know it, but John says um, in the Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 1, in John's vision of the messianic kingdom, he says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, what they were anticipating, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So that water that they look forward to watering the nations, the spirit of God is being poured out, not just from God, but from the throne of the lamb. So the rock they look back to, the outpouring river they look forward to is Jesus. Past, present, future. Jesus is the provision from God. He's sent to give life to people who are dying of thirst. And though they don't know it, <laughs> The water that they celebrate and, 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 and symbolize and need is Jesus himself. The festival's all about Jesus, and he's putting himself right there in the center of it. How cool is that? I love um, what we can get as we kind of take a, a deeper look into this. And if you notice, um, the way Jesus satisfies our thirst is, uh, is the Holy Spirit, who John points out wouldn't be given until after Jesus ascended back to the Father. Um, fortunately for us, and whoever believes now, um, that water of Jesus is not only available for a limited time in his physical presence, um, but it's available without measure. That He gives the Spirit without measure, we read in John chapter 3. Um, and we have that Spirit in us. We'll talk a little bit more about that right at the end. Verse 40. Y'all with me on this still? Okay. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, ah, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. So apparently, as you look back, even in other Jewish writings, the expectations of the Messiah, there was a lot of variance in those, um, including where the Messiah would come from. Some believed that he would just suddenly appear, uh, like verse 27 had said when we were reading that, no one knows where he will come from. They get that from passages like Daniel 9 and Malachi um, they, they don't, some, some people didn't think that we would know where he came from, but other people like those who were spoken of here, um, believed that he would come from Bethlehem because of Micah 5, 2. They're like, well, that prophet says this, um, ironically, of course, Jesus did in fact come from Bethlehem, um, though these people didn't know it. They thought he was more of a Galilean, but, but John doesn't even bother to say that. Like he's not so concerned like, like Matthew and Luke are about the genealogy and the history of where Jesus came from and proving that he's the Messiah that way. The point of this is, I think, verse 43, there was a division among the people over him. That's what John wants to get forward to us. There's all sorts of opinions and divisions, and one person thinks this, and some person contradicts him with that, and there's just all sorts of things going around. So literally division, that word is schisma. There was a schism because of him. It's kind of a recurring theme. If you guys remember, Jeff pointed out um, a couple of times recently with the miracles and with the hard sayings of Jesus, it's like Jesus just comes in and just draws this line and he makes people to go to one side or the other. And he just drives people in a way. He drives them apart because of the truth that he's showing and that he's expressing in his words. So we saw earlier in the passage, he's a good man. No, but he's leading people astray. Other people said those are kind of the simple arguments that we might hear. Oh, Jesus, he was a good man or no, he's not a good man. Fine. Um, these are in, in the section here, there's kind of more sophisticated arguments. Maybe this really was the prophet like Deuteronomy 18 talks about. And somebody else says, no, this, this is the Christ. And somebody else says, well, the Christ can't come from Galilee. So these are kind of the, the real thinkers here. But all sorts of thoughts. Many people believed in him. We read in verse 31, but some of them, verse 32, wanted to arrest him. 
And in earlier chapters, we see, oh, Jesus is significant enough that the Pharisees want to kill him. But the crowds in Galilee, Jesus was concerned we're going to make him king immediately, right? Everyone, y'all, has to make a decision about Jesus. Everybody has to make a judgment about him. They're being driven to that point. And in the chaos, that's what's happening in this story. Verse 44, some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? Remember, they were sent out to, to get him. The officers answered, the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. Like there's something unique. There's something crazy about this guy. The words that he's saying, we haven't heard it before. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that doesn't know the law is accursed. This is like, uh, like theological bullying, right? Like no one with a brain believes this guy. These ignorant crowds, they're confused. They don't, they don't know the scripture. Kind of a, it was a common thing for those religious elites to do, to kind of talk condescendingly about all the commoners there. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, chapter 3, and was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So there's just more kind of condescending bullying towards Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is only mentioned in the book of John. Um, you remember from chapter three, when Jesus talks to him about being born again and the winds of salvation and all this stuff. Um, this is the second time in the gospel that Nicodemus shows up. It seems like he's on some kind of journey of belief. And um, we'll see him again at the end of the book and we'll see, oh, wow, he's actually, he's made some progress. And so the Pharisees are asking the officers that were supposed to arrest Jesus, have any of the authorities or Pharisees believed in him? Come on, you guys, is are anybody important with a brain believing in him? And immediately Nicodemus, a Pharisee, speaks up because I think he's probably uncomfortable with what they're saying because maybe he's starting to believe. And, and the Pharisees had said, hey, this crowd, they don't know anything. They don't know the law. And Nicodemus is like, well, wait a second. Like, shouldn't we abide by the law and give this guy a fair hearing and see what he's all about? Because they're kind of neglecting the law. So he's really bringing up some things. And, and here's what I think, here's how the, the chapter kind of ties together. I think this is what Nicodemus is, is saying. I think he's saying here what Jesus said in verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. You see, they're, they're, they're wanting to make a judgment about Jesus here at the end of the chapter, the Pharisees are, and Jesus had already used the Sabbath kind of to, to talk about how we ought to judge. And Nicodemus is just abiding by that same way saying, hey, let's, let's just take a deep look into this thing. Let's see what Jesus says and what he does, and Nicodemus is saying, let's not judge too quickly. Like, stop jumping to conclusions. Would we just take a minute and look into this? Things aren't always as they seem on the surface. The, the surface level things, all the noise in our ears from the crowds and everybody that's come into this place, that can be distracting. So if we really want the will of God, we need to, we need to listen to this. We need to give this a chance, a fair chance. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, you guys can see maybe why uh, we've said before this is called an evangelistic gospel. John has brought up all kinds of people, um, all kinds of opinions about who Jesus is, a bunch of surface level distractions, and then 
Uh, he's dropped in the midst of that chaos, the truth about Jesus. So all kinds of people, everyone goes to the feast, Galileans, Judeans, the people of Jerusalem who are already there, Jesus' disciples, Jesus' brothers, the crowds or the people, it says, the authorities, the Pharisees, their officers, the chief priests. Some people are there, they know the spiritual significance of the feast, other people probably don't. They're just like, ah, it's a big party. Who could... So all kinds of people, there's all kinds of opinions we've seen through this about who Jesus is. He's a good man. He's leading people astray. He's Messiah. He's the prophet. He's just this dude from Galilee. Everyone kind of has these different bits and pieces about what they've heard, what they've seen, and they're using those things to make a judgment about Jesus. And they have to. They have to have an opinion about Jesus because he's like no one else. The way that he talks is like nobody else. The things that he's doing is like nobody else. The religious leaders are kind of unfairly treating him like nobody else. Like it's this one work that he did on the Sabbath and they're making a big deal and they want to kill him. So all sorts of people, all sorts of opinions, and then just all of these distractions. Like, where's he from? Is he from Galilee? Well, he can't be the one if he's, if he's from Galilee. Well, what he's saying can't be right. He's not studied. There's no one to corroborate the testimony that he gives. Well, nobody important believes this guy. Smart people like the Pharisees, well, they don't believe. He can't be true. People who follow him, like his biggest crowd is out in Galilee. What do they know? We've talked before, like this distraction. He, he's not doing what we would expect him to do as the Messiah. He can't be. He's breaking religious laws, it seems. He can't be the Messiah. Maybe somebody thinks, well, I haven't seen any miracles, but there's all of this distraction and and amidst all of that chaos the sea of people opinions distractions jesus enters this festival where everyone is remembering where they came from where they are now what they hope for they're asking god who jesus says they don't actually know but they're asking him to provide that which will sustain their lives, that which everyone needs, this water of life. And Jesus says in this chaos, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Everything that all of you are asking for, everything that all of you are hoping for, everything that all of you need is found in me. He's not maybe who the people expect. In fact, he wasn't. On the surface, he's just this man from Galilee. But John's showing us again and again, he's not just a man, he does supernatural things. He speaks in a way that kind of takes our natural phenomena like water and food and birth, and he ties it to supernatural concepts like the, the bread of life and living water and spiritual birth. And we're gonna have to look below the surface of this man, Jesus, and, and not just judge by those surface level appearances. I think Nicodemus has it right when he says, hey, slow down. We need to hear him out, look into what he does. We hear all of these opinions. People are saying a lot of things, but this guy's claiming to be the truth. Like we need to judge with right judgment. On the surface, it seems like, hey, there's no way this could be right, but take a deeper look. Might he be who he says he is? Might he offer what he says he offers? Might it be hard for us to fathom because his message is supernatural? One more thing uh, that I want to point out. I, I think this is so cool. I, I think this is what John is doing in the gospel here. Um, Jesus is doing at this Feast of Booths exactly what John described in chapter one. Do you remember this famous verse that we talked about? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Everybody remember what dwelt among us says more literally? He tabernacled right among us or he set up his tent or his booth among us. So I think Jesus in chapter seven is acting out in a in a visual kind of literal sense of what he was doing that john describes in chapter one what he's doing in the world he 
comes into humanity and he makes his tent or his booth among our own. And how gracious I think it is of God to send Jesus in this way so that we could find life in him because we ourselves or the whole world finds itself in kind of this festival of booths. Like we're living in these temporary dwellings. We're thinking about, well, how did we get here? How will we be sustained? Where is everything heading? How can we have hope in the future? And if we're honest, we all know that we need something outside of ourselves that we can't quite reach or we can't quite understand or fathom. So the word God became flesh and explained the truth to us and dwelt among us. And that's what this whole festival is about, is, is him. He comes to us to make himself known. Amongst all the opinions amongst all the people, amongst all the distractions. In God's grace, we have Jesus making himself known among us. Um, I just want to end uh, by sharing a, uh, about a friendship that Mary Beth and I had, we've had for many years. Um, somebody who doesn't believe still uh, somebody who we've had lots of conversations about the gospel with. And uh, she says, some of you have heard heard me talking about her before. Um, she says that what we believe, because we talk about it often, seems like it belongs in a Marvel universe or something like that. Like she describes it like, this is just outrageous what you guys think. Um, and eventually, after numerous conversations, it just kind of became, hey, that's your thing. It's not my thing. And we kind of stopped engaging much about God or, or spiritual things uh, because she kind of knew and she just kind of distanced herself from that part of our relationship and conversation. Well, eventually, I noticed um, a social media post that she put um, that just kind of talked about her depression and different really deep struggles in her life. And so uh, we had her over, Mary Beth and I had her over to our home. And um, we, we told her, hey, I know that you think about our, our Christianity, or our faith. I, I know you think that it's kind of one person's opinion against another. And I know you think that ah, sounds too outrageous. I don't think I could ever believe that. Like, it just seems like a fairy tale. But we told her, but would you please hear from Jesus and you please learn what he has done? And would you look below that surface of, well, this can't be and, and this can't be and that kind of quick glance that you take and would you move below kind of everybody's opinion and would you just find out for yourself who he is and, and what he is offering to you? Um, and this gal, she's into spirituality and a higher power or the universe, right? And um, so not using those exact words uh, or, or the exact words of this passage at the time, but we were kind of telling her the, the one who has sustained your life, who is um, sustaining your life, who offers eternal life, that person is Jesus. And that, that quote unquote universe, he's made himself known to you. He became one of us so that, so that we could understand him. Would you just look past appearances and opinions and would you hear from Jesus and, and learn what he does? And um, she, as I said, has, has not yet believed, um, but she did tell us this. She told us that when she looks, um, and this is, I'm not like trying to massage the story to make it better than it sounds. She said, uh, when she looks at our lives, at the lives of Mary Beth and I, she said, what seems to be unbelievable when, when she looks at us, it starts to become a little bit more believable. And I promise that's not because Jared and Mary Beth are so incredible. 
like Marvel characters or something. But it is because I believe we have drunk from Jesus. And whoever believes in him, like us, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. And so we hope that she and others amidst the sea of opinion and distraction will see and hear in us the supernatural life that Jesus offers and that she too would drink and that she would look below appearances and those that look into our lives would look below just the, the kind of surface level distractions and opinions and what they think that they know and judge with right judgment as they hear and they learn from Jesus based on our lives, based on what we share and based on the conviction of his spirit and his word in their life. So that's John uh, chapter seven, hopefully a way that we can kind of even think about it as we talk to people about Jesus.